I would like to introduce our next and actually very first presenter for the uh, for our docent training program. Mm -hmm. Ladies and gentlemen, big round of applause for Dave Cresson. Yes. Dave is the president of the History Association, so a lot of you guys probably know him already or have seen him around. Thank you for being here. Uh, our challenge together is uh, I've been assigned the mission of presenting coast, an overview of coastside history, and I've been limited to one hour to cover <laughs> a thousand years, a hundred years, ten years. So you can imagine, oh, think of our assignment together as being in an art show where the job is to just look at a landscape. No close-ups, we're just looking at the quick hills and mountains of uh, coastside history. And uh, I, I just hope I can take you on this trip in a way that isn't too fast, that can't get into too much depth, any of the major subjects that, uh, that I hope to talk about today, uh, you could easily talk about for an hour or two hours. So bear with me. Our job together is to fly over the landscape really quickly and come away with the feeling of, okay, I've heard of that. I know about that part of our history. Thing about, thing about coastside history, uh, well, let me start by telling you a little story about myself and how I came to the coast side and really basically how I, how I came to fall in love with this community, which I assume we all share. Does everybody live on what we call the coast side? Montara, the Canyon Nuevo or so? Any, anybody, anybody a foreigner? <laughs> we, we all love this place, but I want you to just bear with me for a second. When I share the trip that I took, I was choosing, I worked in New York City, Madison Avenue, ad guy, very aggressive young man trying to improve my career and become a success at, uh, at my job. And I, I was choosing between these two jobs. One was in Minneapolis and one was in San Francisco. And I really didn't know either community very well, but I decided almost with a flip of a coin I decided that uh, I'd take the job in San Francisco as a better opportunity and uh, I'd become rich and famous here sooner than I'd become rich and famous in Minneapolis. So I got to San Francisco driving. I knew that I wanted to live by the ocean because in New York you always want to live by the ocean, whether it's the Jersey Shore or Long Island Shore, and I had my opportunity. So we drove over the Bay Bridge, went through the city, said, oh, that's pretty, that's the Ferry Building, World Trade Center, that's where it's going to work. Look at, they've got these nice uh, uh, freeways that uh, go right out to the beach. Just look at this map, map, it's marvelous. And so drove immediately off to the beach and I got to Pacifica and all the houses were stacked up next to each <laughs> other, jammed together, and I wasn't aware that what we knew was Levittown, Levittown in the east, was kind of like a perpetual thing, Broadmoor, Daly City, it's mid-60s. Uh, there were just wall-to-wall -wall houses, and I said, oh, this beach is nice, but we're not going to find it here. I'll just, it's going to get better the further I get away from the city. And we drove down Route 1, and all of a sudden, the road and the development stopped because you just faced a big mountain and there's this road that threaded up over it and you all know, we all know, we're talking about double slide and you get to the top, this 800 foot cliff looking down on the water, it was sunny and beautiful that day and you wind along through the slide area and you come out on the other side and it was nothing but it happened to be June and flowers out in the fields all farming house here, a house there, I said, this is it, I've got it. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, that was just the beginning of my love affair with this community, and mm -hmm. I'm so happy that not only did I fall in love with it, it took about two months before I figured out, I don't care what kind of job, I don't care if I get fired, I'm never leaving this place. <laughs> this is, this is, and it took quite a number of years before I fell in love with the history of this place, and I only fell in love with it because I bought an old house, the Zavala house here in town. And uh, 
fell in love with it and started to discover what a remarkable history for a small town this has. We're not a mining town, you know, one act pony. We're not a fishing town. We're not a lumbering town. We're, we've been touched by almost all of the grand events that reflect the history of California. One way or another, from world wars to earthquakes, things we'll be talking about today, we've really lived it here. We had natives, as most small towns do, but we had natives that uh, had a very big part in, uh, in making this, taking advantage of the beauty of this place, and we had explorers, and so forth. Let me get on with that. Let's just plunge right in and uh, Oh, I've got my fashion glasses. Should I give a fashionable talk? Mm -hmm. Or should I give a more serious talk? There. Serious. Serious talk. <laughs> Let's start out with this slide, which uh, tells us the this computer has a mind of its own, I've discovered. Uh, we're, the, uh, the, first, the first slide here is just to say we're talking from Anya Nuevo, up to Pedro Point is what we in the Hampton Bay History Association consider to be sort of our sphere of special interest. And that means that we don't do San Francisco or the mining history, but, uh, uh, but we do the things that happen within this area. And it's huge. There's so many things to talk about here that uh, that we'll be struggling to get through it in the hour. And I'm tossing this, this uh, slide up mainly to show you not, I'm, I'm sure that you couldn't read it in the length of time. If you're sitting in the front row, you can't read it enough to take notes because I'm going to get rid of it. But this is the daunting landscape that I was referring to before. Each of these is a major chapter of things that played a role here in the coast side. And our job for an hour or so, not an hour or so, an hour or less, our job is to touch on each of these and give you a sense of why, why we should be uh, excited. A logical place to start would be to say, we started before anything. There's a prehistoric history here and it fascinates me, this is not going to be fun if it's going to keep flipping by itself. Okay, it, uh, 15 million years ago they dug up this curious character that looks like a, uh, a uh, some combination of a rhinoceros and a walrus. It was, this uh, was dug up over at uh, uh, the SLAC, the Stanford Linear Accelerator. Place and they called it a pa paleoparadoxia, paleoparadoxia, which means paleo, you all know your Latin, it means the earliest of early. And paradoxia, I'm just taking a wild guess that uh, paradoxia means it doesn't make any sense. <laughs> so this curious animal 15 years ago lived right where we are. And what's also especially fun is to is to look at the uh, millions of years ago, what the coast side looked like. Here we are, the star here represents Half Moon Bay, and here's the peninsula. Well, if we go back those 15 million years, eons ago, during the Ice Age, you'll see that we could walk, we could walk if we had our walking shoes, all the way out to the Farallon Islands, which are here, and all the way out to something off uh, Drake's Bay, Drake's Head, that all the way up in Marin County was all dry land. So just if, if we wanted to take a, an appropriate number of minutes to talk about those years, whew, this <laughs> landscape of ours has certainly changed a whole lot. But let's talk about what it is now because my objective is to talk about the coast side the way we love it now. Why did I love it so much when I came here originally a few, so year, many years ago really now, is it's amazing. The redwoods are still here, the babbling brooks are still here, most of the farms are still here, 
And if there's a theme other than <coughs> we love history and other than we love the coast side, if there's a theme that really stems to the fact that we were able to go out in our backyards, literally, and can take this photograph today, still in an age of, uh, of massive development. This is just going to be challenging. <laughs> Uh, I want to talk about the times of the natives. They're known to have been here. They're called, they were called, they are called the Ohlone. They were called the Costa Noa by the Spanish explorers. But this was native land, and what a fabulous land it was for them to live in. Now, you're going to have, uh, in the weeks to come, a world-class expert, absolute world-class ex expert, Mark Hilkenau talk about this subject so I can either skip over it really fast, which I will because he'll cover it beautifully, <coughs> more beautifully than I ever could dare to do. But I'm going to, uh, I'm going to take a slightly different bet that, uh, that most people talking about our natives don't talk about to give, to share a perspective which I think it's exciting to hold in your mind. This is like a time map. And it starts way back here, 1.6 million years ago, when Homo erectus, that is to say, man who stood on his two feet, first of all, 1.7 million years ago or so, with other, with other humanoid-type creatures evolving before that, and Peking man and others after that. But the landmark thing that occurred was about 120,000 years ago, almost yesterday, by these standards. Something came along, something evolved, developed, happened immediately, almost out of nowhere, called Homo sapiens. Homo sapiens was a great leap into what we are, in fact, that's what we are today. It means wise man, man wise, Homo sapiens wise. And that happened 120,000 years ago, and that's really the time that animals began to work smartly together to commune, to come together in groups or tribes, to get to be so human that they got mad at each other and they broke up as tribes and they'd uh, go away and explore new places. And uh, above this red line de denotes the time about 120,000 years ago when Homo sapiens came out of Africa and went to Europe and Asia. It's, uh, that's a breakthrough <coughs> moment in uh, the history of humanity. And it ties into another breakthrough moment, which is very relevant for today. <coughs> During the Ice Age, let's take that as, uh, uh, let's talk about the Homo sapiens that are beginning to migrate away 200,000 years ago. But there was ice all across the top of the, all across the top of the earth. So if you were in Europe or Asia, you couldn't uh, very readily cross that uh, space between the edge of Russia and, uh, and the, what's now the Bering Sea into Alaska. But the ice age, uh, the ice began to melt. And the ice went back from the borders that was all solid ice down into the northern United States. And it began to melt back. And about 18,000 years ago, it's not that long in the overall scheme of things, the water level, the ice went back far enough that you could actually walk across the Bering Straits. It wasn't the Straits, it wasn't a great ocean hundreds of feet deep, but it was a, a plain, and some say a very uh, fertile plain, just as uh, the coast side was. So, so the gates opened about 18,000 years ago, and somewhere in that period is when Homo sapiens began to wander, these are Stone Age people began to wander into uh, our hemisphere. But uh, while the ice was melting, the water level rose. And so in effect, the door that opened, the door closed. And that was about 10,000 years ago that the water rose so fast that uh, you could no longer cross the Bering Straits. It's now a sea. So there was a gate that opened and a gate that closed. And when I talk about coastside history, honestly, I'm fascinated, fascinated by this notion that uh, 
there was a door that opened and closed for Stone Age man to come into North America, and those are the roots of the natives that were here. Here, just for the record, there's that word paleo again. This is a, a timeline for the Stone Age. So the, the uh, period that we're talking about is paleo meaning very ancient lithic, meaning stone, ancient Stone Age. Mesolithic started about the time that, uh, that uh, we could migrate out of Africa and into Europe, and then the latter part of that. The, these Middle Stone Age people who were just you know, basically uh, gathered nuts and berries. They were gatherers and did some, did some modest hunting. So the people that lived here, our natives, were Stone Age people. And they really came here to the coast side as Mezzo, if I'm pronouncing that right, right. Am I pronouncing that right, Paul? You know about all these things, right? Mesolithic, Middle Stone Age people, that's who the Ohlone were. That's who all the natives of uh, North America and South America so they migrated on south. And uh, a mere 11,000 years ago, which is about the time that natives came to, uh, came to the coast side, about 11,000 years ago, most Stone Age people were were becoming Neolithic, which meant that they became able to raise crops, they became able to uh, domesticate animals, and they could uh, herd animals, and they shaped things out of their stones themselves to make mortars and pistols, for example, as one of the differentiators between Middle and Neolithic. So I put that there just as a quick way to say, when we talk about our natives, we're talking about Stone Age people here who were really, really very primitive. And one last concept is these are all the languages of North America, the way they've been identified for the hundred years or so before, uh, before the Spaniards came along doing language studies. All these different colors represent uh, different forms of language, and the reason that I'm sharing this rather academic forgive me table with you is to show that there was just a flow of humanity that continued to migrate literally for thousands of years and blend here and flow there and uh, for the last 10,000 years uh, there's evidence that there were natives here on the coast side and for 6,000 years there's very definite specific archaeological evidence of exactly uh, what period they were in and what their uh, what uh, artifacts they were leaving behind. And as we're talking about the Half Moon Bay History Museum, oh, I hope we have a good display of some of the artifacts that the natives that were here left behind. But I don't want to dwell on it other than to say the most basic things that we know about the natives of uh, the natives of the coast side. First of all, at the time that there was first contact by Europeans with the natives, there were probably 300,000 natives in the U.S. And at that time, 1769, that would be, at that time, there was a group of a similar language construct that lived from San Francisco to Monterey and over in the East Bay, which uh, has been identified as being like a single language group, not exactly a tribe because they didn't exactly hang out with each other. In fact, there were seven or eight different specific language chunks within the custom elements uh, that uh, differentiated each one. And when Mark, Dr. Helkema, when Mark Helkema comes to talk to us in a week or two, I can't remember what he's scheduled for, try not to miss that top flight description of native life. Here. There's, here we're breaking it down into the eight language groups. Just to run over it really quickly, the tribelets that lived here were from 50 in size to 200. There was one tribe that uh, lived at, uh, along Pilarcitos Creek, right close to us, Tunegas Creek, and so forth. They, they are our predecessors. And 
Now, just to do the quick sense, because the natives certainly deserve more than five minutes, that's for sure, but they've had their five minutes with us, but a quick sense of their lifestyle, which uh, you'll be hearing a lot more of the exciting detail about, will be coming at you. Here, uh, here on this table, which I hope gets presented, you'll actually see the period here where our natives switched from just grinding uh, grinding the grains that they lived here, which they lived off mainly the bounty of this coastside. Of course, there was deer, there was, uh, but uh, the combination of uh, ocean food, fish, oh, what a place, and grass, a little further up the hills and over on the other side of the coast range, they were living on acorns, and, but the grass seeds or the acorns, whichever, they at first would grind them with a rock that they found on top of another rock that they found and do the best they could to grind it into a meal and mush. And in the later years before the Spanish came, 1769, they actually started shaping those rocks into hollows that you could use like a bowl, mortars and the pistol that they used. So this is, this is the archaeological stuff. So these, this is a typical Alwini hut made out of tule reeds. And it brings us to that famous moment, 1769, that uh, Gaspar de Portola, the great uh, explorer, uh, came through. But Drake was the first. 1579 was the first explorer. Viscano, Viscano, who's a better Spanish Viscaino. speaker? Viscano. No, it's not a no. It's a no. Viscano. Uh, Came. He was sent. Uh, he was sent by the Spanish because uh, uh, they were exploring to set uh, military to claim Alta California for Spain. And Vizcaino came along and he discovered what he thought was a fabulous uh, harbor at Monterey. He was a shipbound explorer. And 150 some odd, 160 some odd years ago, Spain sent Portola up to go on land find a place to set up a mission because they were afraid of the Russians and the English and the Americans in 1769 would be taking their Alta California away from them. And the poor Tola walked within just a few hundred feet of where we're sitting today. I can almost picture his troop coming through there, exploring, coming overland, hard done by a long trip. He started in Mexico, San Diego, and came up all by land with uh, a large group of soldiers, a few uh, mission fathers, ready to do make an establishment that would warn off interlopers that might take uh, that might take Alpha California away from them, and uh, also on what they considered to be a sacred mission of converting or saving the natives and uh, show them a, a uh, higher civilization that. The mission fathers and the Spaniards would be able to bring them. So that was their that was their expedition in 1769, and uh, specifically they were going to find Monterey, and specifically they were going to form a mission there, but because Monterey looks more like a bay from the sea than it does from land. By land, it just you really don't notice any much of a protected bay. So board to Portola. De Portola, to pronounce it uh, as he did. He, he uh, and his group just marched right on past the bay, never saw it. Oops, made a little mistake. And they were pretty sure that it was a mistake because they kept marching and marching, and they still didn't find anything that, re that uh, resembled Viscaino's uh, charts and maps. So they kept marching and they came through Pescadero. Santa Cruz, Pescadero, through Half Moon Bay, writing a great diary about what they saw, the natives they met, and what the coast looked like, rich in food and, and uh, rich in animals, rich in grizzly bears, by the way, not, uh, not necessarily so good, but food, marched right on by, went, kept on going, still looking for Monterey, when they finally got to Pacifica, and went up over the coast range in Pacifica, a place called Sweeney Ridge, and what did they find? 
Francisco Bay. San Francisco Bay. So it was De Portola right after he came through here, as as modern history puts it, discovered San Francisco Bay. Now that's modern history. The natives have taken some umbrage with that, <laughs> saying, well, actually we knew about it before you did. What's the big deal? So we're not allowed to say that De Portola discovered San Francisco Bay anymore. We have to say that uh, he was the first foreigner to see San Francisco mm -hmm. Bay. And, of course, he said, this is definitely not Monterey Bay. We failed, mm -hmm. and let's turn around and go home. And that is almost literally what De Portola said. They did turn around and come home, but Father Crispy, one of the mission fathers that was on this expedition, said, you know, we saw a body of water that's so big it could hold all the ships of a mighty nation. I think there's some potential there. And of course that diary entry was largely overlooked for quite a number of years. But uh, nevertheless, he did discover San Francisco and uh, the Anza mission followed and that's when uh, that's when uh, Mission Dolores was founded. So here we have uh, a few uh, images just to capture the spirit of the, the De Portola mission. He's, this is supposed to be the discovery moment, which I guess we now have to call the seeing moment. And uh, next year, 1769 date on the, on, uh, the Portola expedition that's the 150th anniversary so watch your newspapers the city the council and our city and hopefully our history association will be doing something to develop a uh, great tourist trail with interpretive signs and so forth to celebrate the 150th anniversary and it will be called the or the uh, Oloni Portola Trail and uh, will become a uh, permanent like long trail park site, so we should be excited about that. Which brings us to the missions. The uh, mission Dolores is the one that's of closest to us and the greatest interest to us. It was founded in uh, 1776 by an amazing coincidence. 1776, it was the uh, first service at Mission Dolores in San Francisco was held on, uh, I think it was June 25th, 1776, within a week of when, on the other side of this continent of ours, a Liberty Bell was being rung by the Americans. And we just, I know that I've learned my history in a way that I thought we had a very developed civilization here in uh, the United States of America as it became that day on July 4th, 1776. And it was a mature civilization. Well, on the other coast, within a week of that day, a week earlier, is when Mission Dolores opened a primitive frontier in exploration for the Spanish. So they, here they formed a presidio. That's a place for the soldiers, the mission. That's a place for the uh, Indians to uh, learn how the Christian uh, belief system worked. And in many of these stops along El Camino Real, they'd form a little community. Well, they didn't really form a community in San Francisco exactly, but they did have a few houses outside the, the, uh, outside the mission and outside the Presidio. And the people that staffed this, uh, each mission were the Spanish explorers, commanders, <coughs> administrators, the Mexican soldiers, the ones that did the heavy lifting, the Spanish mission fathers, and of course the, the uh, native neophytes. There's a picture of uh, Mission Dolores, and here's, uh, here's a Mission uh, Father Pro Proselyte. Oh, I'm going to stop on this. That was a picture of uh, Unipera Serra, who became sainted recently, amidst uh, considerable controversy, because, of course, now we think of the missions as, to make a long story very, very short, sort of the uh, domination of a new culture which effectively destroyed a beautiful old culture. So it's not without controversy what, uh, what the Mission Fathers did. But 
I'm fairly well convinced that at least the Mission Fathers were very well intentioned and really were trying to save this new humanity and the idea that sooner or later, if you consider that the natives, <clears throat> that the natives were really Stone Age people meeting a very advanced society, was to step away from the Industrial Revolution by a hundred years or so. Sooner or later, somehow, one way or another, that uh, society that had survived for so many thousands of years, the Ohlone and the other natives of California and the United States, would eventually just simply be crushed virtually overnight for what took uh, thousands of years in other parts of the world. But overnight, their, uh, their lives would change. Little footnote on this is this is these are a couple of the little pueblos, the little houses outside the presidio, and in these houses, uh, two families lived: the Miramontes family and the Briones family. And I point this out to you especially. It's a genuinely a, a little-known, wonderful fact of coastside history that uh, Miramontes is arguably the first, uh, had the first civilian housing along with the Briones family outside the Presidio, which makes him, according to my wonderful way of interpreting history, which is a little loose, makes him like almost the first civilian resident of San Francisco. And of course, as we'll see in just a few minutes, Candelario Miramontes is the person essentially that founded Half Moon Bay. So, first Resident of San Francisco, Yerba Buena, outside the walls of the Presidio, is the father of downtown Half Moon Bay. You can take that fact and tuck it away because the rest of the historians of the world will utterly ignore it. But I find it a whole lot of fun. Just very quickly through this, the mission era lasted from that same 1776 until the uh, 1834, uh, in between there, uh, Mexico won its independence from Spain in 1821, and in 1834 the mission era ended when the, mission, when the uh, uh, Mexicans decided to get rid of the mission fathers as major landowners. The mission fathers could stay and run their churches if they want, but they couldn't have them the huge ranches anymore, which was, that whole process was called, uh, um, come on, David. Secularization. Who said that? What was? <laughs> Good job. Secularization. So, and the bottom line, I don't feel we can fairly leave the natives without just remembering the controversy. The controversy that, uh, on the one side, the Mission Fathers thought that they were raising these primitive people of great deprivation into a more advanced and civilized lifestyle and would have their almighty souls saved. But there's another side to that, specifically that the Spanish came along and enslaved them to do mission work, working in uh, trades that they had no way. and. Uh, doing the gardening, which they didn't really know how to do before, and making clothes and all kinds of things that uh, didn't really resonate with them. So being enslaved is the other side of that argument. And uh, somebody trying to find some author that I just couldn't help but love the way he turned the phrase, said that uh, they were not enslaved, they were merely indentured by a debt of religious obligation. <laughs> So turn the phrase any way you want. The story didn't turn out very well for the natives, and they went uh, from great numbers of healthy people down to very, very few alonies at least survive to this day. And the intentions may have been good, but the results not so much. So we're going to blast past uh, the Mexican life. They did become, they formed between 1821 and uh, the next great milestone, they formed a community in Northern California. They were trying now to protect Alta, that is Southern Northern California, trying to protect, protect Alta, California from the Russian fur traders and from the English who were coming down from Canada as fur traders and the Americans who were forever pushing forward. And the way that uh, 
that occurred to them during their life here, which was really a pretty primitive life, largely raising the cattle they brought over. But it was a fun life. They were festive. They had a great deal of fun. I love this one slide that I put up, which says that uh, uh, this is a typical way that the Mexicans viewed private property. It's a hitching rail where the horses are there, and if some tired rider came into town on their way to the next town, he could just drop his horse off, tie it up, leave it that belonged to the community, and he could pick up a fresh horse and take it on to the next ride. Sort of a, a little bit of socialism in a very nice, and as long as it's understood, everybody wins way. Just quick little glance at, uh, at the Mexicans. They lived here kind of largely the way that, uh, largely the way that we picture them to this day, living on beef because they raised cattle and uh, beans and tortillas and so forth and uh, grew a few vegetables. So they certainly advanced things a little bit from the hunter-gatherer way of the people, the natives that uh, occupied us before. And of course, this is one of the champions, the well, a particularly well-educated California or Mexican-born Spanish subject who became the most powerful man in, uh, in Mexican, New Mexico, Alta California, uh, and actually became a member of the California State Senate after uh, we became the United States, or became California, became part of the United States. In order to protect and give the Mexicans an incentive to stay, the Mexican government gave huge land grants. We casually refer to them as, as land grants. They are Mexican land grants. There are very, very few Spanish land grants given in this area. But the whole idea was, if we give this these vast pieces of land, four pieces of which make up our coastline, if we give these huge pieces of land, to the natives, but not to the natives, to the Mexicans that are far, far, far away from their, uh, from their ancestral home in Mexico, that they'll defend it and they'll keep it for Mexico. And so the incentive was give them the land and they'll, pro and they'll protect it for Mexico. But they were so poor, they were so primitive, and progress was coming, sure as shooting, that it didn't work for much. That was the theory behind it, but it didn't work. And already in the 1840s, the United States was uh, the United States was trying to trying to acquire California and a few other states. This thing definitely has a mind of its own. You know, I can go at its pace just as easily. You can't bully me. <laughs> So uh, the U.S. the U.S. offered the Mexican government thirty million dollars for California. Not a, that's a pretty hefty price, but California thought not enough. That won't work for us, they said, and the U.S. did what uh, the United States uh, sort of had a habit of doing back in those days. They didn't raise their price; they just declared the Mexican-American War. And uh, in the Mexican-American War, they, of course, handily, because they were land-based, they had all the assets, an organized army and so forth, they uh, relatively easily drove the, the Mexican soldiers out of control. And in uh, 1848, they signed a treaty that ended the Mexican-American War, and there are two uh, there are two facts about that treaty, one of which is kind of amusing, and the other one in the facts is kind of startling. Uh, the <coughs> one fact was that they offered, even though they won the war and the treaty was signed, they still offered the Mexicans money for California. But the bid was lowered to $15 million. So I guess all the Mexican-American War did was win a better price, a lot better than the $30 million they offered before, and they paid them $15 million. But the nice part is that they said that the land grants, if the Mexican was given a land grant, they could keep their land grant. That would be their land grant. 
And so, uh, and indeed, many of them did. So we're standing on the Miramontes land grant, of course, in downtown mm -hmm. Catherine Bay. And Miramontes was able to prove that he actually was given that land grant. So uh, his family, actually, he passed away, but his family was able to protect him. And uh, it became Miramontes' property. So for quite a number of years, the Miramontes' owned this land, even though the Mexicans had lost the war. We spoke before about a, uh, a coincidence. Another coincidence of date was that, uh, did you know that it was within a week or two of us discovering gold, that is Sutter's gold, out of Sutter's fort, it was within a week or two of that foreigner, Sutter was a foreigner, working on Actually, believe it or not, a Mexican land grant. He was had ingratiated with the Mexican government. They, they were perfectly happy to have him there. But he discovered gold within a week of the day that uh, the Mexican-American War was lost. And of course, that changed the economy. Really, it changed the economy, obviously, of California. That gold was discovered. The gold rush began. and. Uh, Mexico just got completely cut out of any opportunity from the huge wealth that the gold rush brought. And please note that that was 1848, not 1849. The gold rush actually began in 1849. But gold was discovered in 48. If history got that right, I'm sure you're all aware that our beloved football team should have been called the San Francisco 48ers. <laughs> Just say that. So, Americans rushed. They came by sea around the coast, around the tip of South America. They came across the Isthmus of Panama, and they came on a months-long journey uh, across the United States in wagon trains, and that's when uh, we basically became an American, an American place. This is a very, very early map which shows that transition as the Americans came and the Mexicans were pushed back onto their land grants. This map uh, is 1860, roughly, and so we're, uh, let's see, 1848, so we're basically over 10 years this house that we're standing in was built somewhere in the mid-1850s, only five or six years after gold was discovered. And I put three stars here just to show the three locations of three prominent buildings which survived for some years. And But all, each of these dots, which you certainly can't see from where you're sitting, but each of these dots represents the coastside getting populated. Down here in, uh, in Purissima, if anybody noticed uh, that Purissima was a disputed property uh, and there was land grants so Americans could move into that disputed property, but the rest were land grants. Our friend uh, Miramontes sold a fellow by the name of Johnston half of his land grant in 1853 and uh, other land was being sold off just in bits and pieces. And so those three stars, this represents uh, what uh, we think uh, the Miramatis adobe, which is right in downtown Half Moon Bay, looked like. That was built in the 1840s. And uh, anybody know where Pat Roma's office is downtown? <laughs> That's where that adobe was. This is uh, just off Mill Street and uh, just off Main Street. Did it run parallel to the creek? Was it parallel to the creek? The border, the no, it did not. Okay. And the border of the land grant was the creek. That was the northern border of the land grant. And he was pretty darn close to it. That was his town and he had a bridge across it. And uh, so did uh, the Johnstons. So, and that's like this picture now because somebody reminded me that they know when that picture was taken because the garden wasn't developed as well. So thank you for that heads up. But uh, this picture was taken a while ago actually, but 
That's the Johnston House, which is one of the first of the non-Mexican uh, houses built as Half Moon Bay was getting settled. Zabala House, this fellow Stanislaw Zabala came along and uh, he, like so many Americans, knew that one way to acquire property was the way that uh, Johnston did, which is he paid money for it, but Zabala had a better idea. He married the eldest daughter <laughs> of the Miravadas family and uh, he not only came into a nice place to build, but came into uh, came into a lifestyle, a Spanish speaker, very well educated. The Mexicans, of course, were, uh, did not have the benefit of a good education, were basically illiterate, and didn't speak the same language, English, that the new American residents did. So uh, Zavala came in as a well-educated force representing the Miramontes community, which was actually a ranch for the years between uh, that land grant and the time that gold was discovered and most many Mexicans just got out of the way of the Americans. They weren't they weren't well received, so they retreated in many cases to the coast side. And uh, Zabala began to play a role that turned out to be a very important part of developing Half Moon Bay by laying out the streets and the sidewalks of Half Moon Bay the way downtown the way downtown looks today was uh, at Zabala's hand, a subject we'll pick up at a later time. Commerce developed. Uh, these are just a wonderful tour de force. The Americans came, they built resort hotels, they built uh, uh, the, uh, this is the Levy Brothers came in 1877, that's one of their early buildings up in that corner, they brought saloons, of course, and uh, blacksmiths and markets, and the world in Half Moon Bay and the rest of the coast side, but especially Half Moon Bay, because it was the crossroads, uh, began, began to change and become Americanized. And churches began, one of the earliest, the earliest, in 1856, was uh, the Catholic Church, Our Lady of the Pillar, and was first where the Pillarcito Cemetery is in 1856, but it burned down fairly promptly, and a brand new, more elaborate church was rebuilt in 1868. And most of you wouldn't know where that is. It's such a beautiful building, it's a shame to lose it. Uh, but it was torn down when the, when the Catholic Church became so wealthy that it uh, <coughs> that it had to expand, so they built the new church and tore that beautiful old one down, sad to say. I just wanted to say a quick word about the ghost town, or the thriving town that became a ghost town of Purissima. It's the next major creek down, as you know, and uh, for many people in this room know full well what Purissima was about, but uh, it was a canyon, it was the place, the canyon was that disputed property where Americans flooded in and uh, homesteaded it and uh, made it into a community that looks, in this picture, which is done by a world famous lithographer in the early 1870s, like a thriving town, every bit as thriving and Americanized as, uh, as Half Moon Bay was at the time. And this is the ocean side. It was mainly, as the farms were, it was mainly along a creek where they had water that they could uh, do some minor irrigation. Most of it was dry farming. Many uh, Irish people here uh, raising uh, potatoes up in the canyons. But perhaps uh, the only thing of this beautiful town that's left, by the way, uh, question time. Who knows what's left of Purissima, the town of Purissima today? They heard? The cypress trees. The cypress trees, that's true. The cemetery. And the cemetery. And for the real history walk, the old, the second schoolhouse there, it was around long enough that it actually had a schoolhouse replaced. The second schoolhouse is still there today, but it's somebody's home across the, across the road from uh, the uh, Purissima open space property. But up at the head
ahead of Pyrrhus and Macanion was one of the great industries of the coastline, and that's the uh, that's the lumber industry. All the redwoods, and they're still just remarkably they're they're still there in a park, but they were. This is the place where the redwood, the lumber that came to build San Francisco, came out of Pyrrhus and Macanions, the surrounding canyons, and the other side of the hill. That's where the wood that came to uh, came to become San Francisco was harvested, and somewhere the redwood that this beautiful house came from. And, uh, if there are docents here, there's an argument that the wood for this house came from Santa Cruz by ship and was dropped off. Other people think that it might have come out of the out of the canyon that's about three miles due east, but it would have been hard to get it over land, so the by ship drop-off was good. And there was another source of wood on the coast side near Frenchman's Creek. So the wood was, uh, wood was radically harvested. They wiped out the hillsides pretty much. Hatch was a famous uh, Half Moon Bay resident who made his mark and uh, by harvesting wood. Farming was an important part. I tossed in a couple of gratuitous artichoke shots in this picture, but farming is really what the coast side was almost all about. The vast majority of the people here became either farm owners or the people working farm labor. But there was also a vast maritime experience here because uh, shipping <coughs> shipping was going up and down the coast linking the world to San Francisco by sea particularly after the gold rush uh, showed the shippers that it's easy relatively easy to make money by sending furniture and uh, East Coast goods to San Francisco which grew by leaps and bounds hundreds of thousands of people in the first decades but of course, where there are ships and a rugged coast and uh, sailing boats, sailing ships, there were shipwrecks. And Pigeon Point Lighthouse, you may know, and if you didn't, you'll soon find out, was named after a ship called the Carrier Pigeon that uh, ran aground there. And eventually lighthouses started to pop up to protect the shipping. And that particular one was named after the ship that crashed there which, by the way, it, uh, it had, this is another ship, but the, the carrier pigeon, if I remember the story correctly, had, uh, had a lot of paint in it to paint the houses of San Francisco, and the residents of Pescadero ran down to the ocean, and the reason that Pescadero has always been such a bright and white, always... <laughs> yeah. So, this is another of the, the shipwrecks, and this is... Uh, an item called a dead eye. It's one of the few artifacts that we have ready for our history museum, and that one of our one of the friends of our museum collected this uh, down at the beach. And this is called a dead eye, and it's an old-fashioned pulley. The way that they pulled the sails up and down was uh, by putting ropes connected to the sails through these two holes, and the, the rope that you pull them up with. Through this hole, so this is a this is a 1800s uh, nautical pulley, which uh, which was found and given to us, and also to be on display. In fact, technically, it is on display at our uh, little museum already. Shipwrecks were so common that uh, the U.S. government learned that they had to set up uh, little customs houses along the beach, and this is one from the late 1800s where they had their American flag flying and if you wanted to salvage stuff you had to come through customs right on the beach and pay for it. One of our famous artists, Galen Wolf, did this picture of the sinking of the, or he called it the wreck, of the Alice Buck. And that was right off the uh, 18th tee of the uh, golf course. And the story is fun. It's complicated, it's exciting, it's heroic. People died, people uh, were rescued. Here in this picture, which uh, which Gail and Wolf got was, these were people that made it to shore off the rocks as the Alice Buck went down. 
and so some of them made it, some of them didn't. Ranchers from uh, that owned the ranch where the golf course now is came down to try to rescue them. One of them ran up to uh, Amesport, the Great Pier, and uh, uh, at Pillar Point, at what is now Pillar Point, and there was a steamship, combination steamship sailing ship, in the port. That at that time and the guy ran up there and said you've got to go down and try to save these people and they used her, he depicted the mast of the rescue ship that came the five or so miles south to try to pick up survivors and sadly uh, about half of the crew died but about half of the crew lived and it's a, it's a thrilling story that not only made it into books but made it into uh, local art. So here's a fast rundown of this is uh, of, of our coast side and depicting a little bit of our maritime history. I love this picture because this is uh, Montara light. Uh, before it got its skirt, Montara's light that was just an oil lamp up on basically on top of four legs, signaling ships to stay away. This is dangerous place. With, oh, what a beautiful cottage which is still there and we're going to have a meeting in this building, as I understand it, as part of our progress in, uh, in our docent work. Año Nuevo. Fishing, of course, was a huge part of our, mainly because of the skills that the Portuguese brought uh, from the Azores, where they learned how to do whaling. You know how close the whales come to our coast side here during migration period. Well, if you have enough courage, and you're from the Azores, you know that you can get in a six-man whaling ship and row out to the whales and hit them with the harpoon. <coughs> Instead of going back to a mother ship, you come back. You come back to uh, come back to shore, and right in uh, right at Pillar Point, among other places, uh, they did the whaling and they did they render they melt down the oil and made some, uh, made some easy money right here on the coast side until oil became uh, a little easier to get out of the ground at the turn of the century. That a little more important. So we're not sure where that wonderful old picture was painted, but it could easily, this is, these are the renderings, and there's the whale being, uh, having its blubber carved off, and this guy up there on the point watching to see if the whales are coming. Harper's Weekly really captured that beautifully. So there, which uh, we will linger on, was a quick history of what I was just describing. So at that point, things were well enough developed that the stagecoaches came, and they lived from 1860 until uh, 1906. And we'll soon remember why 1906 was pretty much the end of the stagecoach service to the coast side. But other infrastructure was going in. There's Ames, that's the remains of Ames Pier, but that was a huge pier that serviced shipping. Uh, at Pigeon Point here is a construction picture of uh, Pillar Cito Stam, a huge, the, probably the biggest project, biggest project, public project of the coast side until we dug the tunnel through the through Montara Mountain, but that, uh, that water dammed up Pillar Cedos Creek, effectively took Pillar Cedos water away from Half Moon Bay, and uh, the people that built that dam, the Spring Valley Water Company, built a whole bunch of flumes and uh, dikes and took all that water that used to come to Half Moon Bay to give us water and took it the other way into Crystal Springs and up to San Francisco, and it became in my judgment, it became a pilot project for what turned, they proved that you can take water out of a faraway dam, ship it by flume, all the way, in this case, about 10 miles south, and then about 30 miles north to San Francisco, and keep San Francisco, which had practically no water alive, as a thriving community. So it was the pilot project, I would argue, for the Hetch Hetchy Dam project. And they took the little old Pillar Cedars Dam and replaced it with the Hetch Hetchy Dam. And now, because they took our water before, we get part of the Hetch Hetchy water. And we get water from 
the pillar seat of the stand. And you can't get in to see it because the water company won't let you in there. Too many trout and other <laughs> bounteous fishes. So infrastructure galore. Here's the Main Street Bridge, the first steel reinforced uh, uh, structure in the world, according to uh, according to that headline. Well, it's not quite true. It wasn't the first one in the world, but it was probably the first one in San Mateo County. And interestingly, it survived the 1906 earthquake. And that was kind of a tip to people all over the world that a reinforced concrete bridge survived the earthquake. So this is the brick building. Zabawa built this brick building, by the way. He sold it to uh, De Benedetti. And uh, it was it was made out of brick because brick was fireproof. And fireproof is a good thing because that's what most buildings were made out of wood and most buildings were burned down. What they didn't realize is that San Francisco or the Bay Area or California has earthquakes and earthquakes don't deal with brick buildings very well. Di Benedetti literally woke up. Di Benedetti, by amazing coincidence again, he was the county supervisor that ordered that reinforced concrete bridge built in 1900. And six years later, here he is sleeping in the top floor of his uh, brick store, combination store and home. <clears throat> here he is sleeping on the second floor, and he wakes up on that fateful April morning to look out at a pile of bricks that, uh, that used to be his building. And he said, this isn't going to work, but I think I know the answer. Reinforced concrete. So why is the De Benedetti building, that's uh, on Mill and Main Street, why is the De Benedetti building famous among other reasons? It was uh, built as an answer at built it immediately the very same year out of the building material that he discovered was earthquake proof and of course that became part of the California standard, in fact probably the world standard for earthquake proofing buildings was to make it out of reinforced concrete. This is a picture of the Zabala house after the earthquake so it's a fun picture. Now, why did the stage stop running in 1906? And the answer is because the railroad came. And I've got a dozen really nice pictures of the railroads, but it, the railroad was supposed to bring fame and fortune and commerce. Wherever the railroad went, everybody made money. It brought commerce, money, development, and indeed, these, this dream, this hotel never appeared in uh, Moss Beach, of course, but that's the way they were dreaming, was uh, the railroad was going to bring riches, and it did. It brought, uh, it brought Nye's Reefs, an inventive fellow who thought his, uh, his resort would be right down on the beach. Uh, it didn't work out too well. You can't build on our beaches very well, so it got wiped out a few years later. The Coast Sidewalk built beautiful schools in anticipation of the uh, rush of population that would come. And most of all, it brought subdivisions. But I'm just going to fly through these pictures. They're wonderful old pictures of the railroad. The most photographed thing about the Coast Side is its railroad. It just attracted photographers just when the camera was getting popular. So there's no shortage of great pictures of the days of the railroad. Great wrecks, great landslides <coughs> going across Devil Slide. Of course, uh, the rails were wiped out and rebuilt, not unlike the way the roads were even during our life and experience here. And they finally ended up, as they were getting closer and closer to poverty, as uh, roads were being built and cars, gasoline cars were getting affordable and the Model T, they ended up with single little rail cars that were gas powered and a desperate attempt to try to survive, but it really didn't uh, really didn't work out too well. Here's a wonderful artifact, though, is the Arleta Park Station. You may know it's right down in the, on the west side of the highway, right in Half Moon Bay. And I singled this picture out because this is an old uh, railroad depot that was uh, picked up and moved over to the Methodist Church and became their meeting room. And they expanded a few years ago, and uh, 
it's going to become especially significant to us because next week, where are we going to meet? We're going to meet right in that building because they moved it right outside this window. So that's where we'll be meeting next week. The most important thing that the railroad brought was the developer. Everything was subdivided. Very hard, very hard process to subdivide property, but they had the markup. So they designed beautiful, beautiful subdivisions from uh, Montara, Moss Beach, El Granada, especially Princeton by the City, and uh, on up into Arlita Park. Uh, is all railroad subdivisions, and they sold them by the thousands. But people discovered that this wasn't going to be Coney Island. They discovered that the water is too cold. A discovery I made, by the way, after I moved here, thinking that it was like the Jersey Shore. It's not. <laughs> and by the way, unlike my first year here, I discovered, as they discovered, there's a lot of fog here. So the subdivisions were successful. A lot of properties got sold, and they were legally subdivided, which is a huge process. But they didn't build very many houses. So that left. That left the seeds for a later era, which makes us wonder just how lucky we are. The years of Prohibition were exciting. This, this by the way, is a local family standing outside a cave where they held, hid their, their uh, booze from the feds, which uh, we don't know whether they were brewing their booze or whether it was smuggled in from the sea because on this sea coast we had literally dozens of speakeasies, roadhouses they call them. The laws of prohibition were flawed. They had bootlegging, smuggling the smuggling the booze off the ships across the beaches onto these dark roads and foggy canyons to San Francisco and lots of brewing taking place in the canyons, moonshining. And after prohibition I'm going to skip the uh, little problem of the Depression because it really didn't affect the coast side that much. Lust as we were, we were an isolated farm community and uh, when it came to food and survival, the Depression didn't hit us the way it did Wall Street and Manhattan and so forth. But World War II came and uh, they were loaded for bear because they were afraid of the, afraid of the Japanese crashing in on us. Okay, checking my watch. I think I've just hit my one hour mark. So, time for me to hasten on. There were many, many points of uh, defense ranging from patrols, ranging from tra training units in uh, Montana, live gunfire training. You'll hear a lot about the Point Montana anti aircraft gun batteries there and the anti aircraft training. But uh, this community of ours was bristling with guns and soldiers and armament because we were living in horrible fear that uh, the Japanese would be invading our shores just as they had Pearl Harbor shores with the massive invasion. They built an airfield. They built this as the anti-aircraft uh, uh, training schools away from the batteries. And here's a picture of the batteries which are located, you'll hear all about this next in a week or so, but these are the batteries with uh, all the trainees shooting out over the ocean at uh, flying moving targets of various sorts. So the worst part, and I just have to tell the story, the worst part was that uh, the Japanese farmers who had been here for years uh, were summarily picked up and deported to uh, Arizona, to a concentration camp in Arizona from the first months of 1942. Bombs were dropped at Pearl Harbor in 1941. They were picked up, had to report to a center where they were taken first to Pacifica or Tanferan, where they were gathered again, and then off to Arizona where they spent the duration of the war, all their property. Uh, wasn't confiscated, but they weren't paying for it, so many of them lost it. And uh, even when they came back, it, uh, they weren't often welcomed back because of, uh, of the uh, shock 
that the Japanese brought us by attacking Pearl Harbor. The, Jap the Germans and the Italians that lived here, if they weren't citizens, they weren't trotted off to uh, concentration camps like the Japanese. I presume that's because the Japanese had a different skin color, so they got different treatment. Oh, that's right, on the Pacific Coast, the Japanese attacked from the Pacific. But if you were Italian or German, you weren't allowed to live west of the ocean because they were afraid you'd be sending signals to Axis ships. So this was the coast highway at the time. This was the state road, and this is Main Street, Half Moon Bay. Now it comes down here. But anybody that farmed on this side, if you were not a citizen and you were Italian or German, you couldn't cross Main Street. You couldn't cross the state highway. You had to stay on this side. If you were a baker, as one was, who had his bakery shop on the other side of Main Street instead of this side of Main Street, you couldn't go to your shop anymore. So a moment of uh, displacement and unfairness. Well, time moves on. The great booming economy, the world, the war was over, prosperity reigned, money everywhere, the depression was over, everybody was flooding for the second great land rush to California. And in order to control our growth, we, uh, in Half Moon Bay, well, we're not in Half Moon Bay right now. Half Moon Bay is across the street. So, mm -hmm. so we're not part of Half Moon Bay. But actually, this is Half Moon Bay property we're on. So in any event, Half Moon Bay became an incorporated city in 1959 so that they could control and prepare for the prosperity that was about to come because this was the age of Broadmoor and Daly City and the Levitt towns of the East here and the huge population growth that came, uh, that came to California. And uh, Half Moon Bay was getting ready for it and all of California was getting ready for it. This uh, remarkable headline, this is from uh, mid-1960s, about the time that I was coming along, showed this uh, subdivision in Montara being, uh, being prepared for sale. And, uh, and uh, the headline boasts that 50,000 people would be uh, going into this Montara development. Montara, just one of the towns of the coast side. Yeah. El Granada, finally, all those previously subdivided <laughs> lots and more were to come. They were already subdivided in El Granada. They were already subdivided in Princeton by the sea. And so in uh, mid-1960s, this was published in uh, 64, uh, mid-1960s we were braced. The freeways had already been spreading across the other side. We were blacktopping uh, we black the mountains, the easy places, the flat places on the bay side first. Pacifica was, uh, got its freeway. And just they actually bought the property for all of the development. <coughs> they bought the property for the freeways coming over Montara Mountain, and uh, the freeway was laid out to come over the now uh, easy to cover route. So the timing was right. The coast side would be the last, but it would be the best and the finest. And uh, so, so there was Montara would be the first to fall and other subdivisions in Moss Beach, El Granada were ready to go and so forth. So this is uh, the bay, you can argue that uh, the breakwater was built in anticipation for a huge fishing industry and a huge commercial and recreational arena. So the stage was all being set for the development of the coast side. And the funny and wonderful thing happened. In fact, we'll just uh, skip ahead for a moment to say what really did happen. The freeways didn't come. A wonderful thing happened. And the wonderful thing was a new kind of consciousness that came across the country just as the freeways were about to be built onto the coast side. Rachel Carson and a number of other loud voices came out and said, you know, open space, ecology, protection, conservation are good things. Silent Spring being uh, sort of a, a uh, landmark book 
written to say progress should not necessarily be our most important progress. Maybe pro you know, progress should not be our most important product. Perhaps preservation, open space and conservation should be. And that's when the conflict that makes our coastside what it is today, and I suspect part of uh, what most of us love about it, began. That uh, the growth and the no growth of conservation versus development battle broke out. And it, uh, it started in the mid-1960s with uh, zealots on both sides shouting at each other. But the net result is that Proposition 20 was passed which uh, guaranteed everybody access to the beaches, plus a lot of other development uh, rules and regulations happen. And then uh, Proposition, I uh, can't remember the letter, one of the letters here in Half Moon Bay, and a similar spirit for the, for the uh, unincorporated parts of the coast side occurred, which limits growth to just 1%. And somehow or other, the tidal wave of growth that was sweeping over us in 1965 stopped just in the nick of time. And here we sit with still our farmlands and still our creeks and still our redwood forests. But, uh, God bless us. Oh yes, I guess I should make this point. We still have a lot of lively things going on. Those are the dawns, the events of Half Moon Bay, the drag strip was here. Are you wearing your sweatshirt, Sheila? <laughs> Mavericks is here, great fun. So we still have a lot of life, even if we don't have the buildings. But, uh, but uh, changes, changes have certainly come to the coast side. Buildings have happened, developments have happened, but the ocean is still here. The forests are still here, and uh, I can say that we're blessed to live in a place that is rich in history, stood at the threshold of development, and uh, yet somehow we've managed to have the beauty and do it. So that's my message, ladies and gentlemen. Lots of stuff. So you guys got all that? You ready to know <laughs> <laughs> that? Dave, when did the Portuguese come? Uh, great question. The answer is the Portuguese started coming very early in the game in the 1870s. And of course the reason that we feel that this is a Portuguese community is because although the Irish came in much greater numbers and, uh, and uh, the Mexicans were here in large numbers, uh, they, there were about 10% of the population, which is a big percentage for Portuguese in 1870. But their spirit and their chamarita and their festival has, have all lasted. So. Uh, of all of the melting pot that the coast side wonderfully is, the Portuguese planted their planted the flag of their culture and their tradition, especially with the chamarita, and they stay today prominent and hopefully uh, they'll stay forever.